Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes and this is your 70th video cast and 60th podcast for the week ending February 19th, 2021. It was a holiday shortened week, so we're going to get right down to it. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Devik Jane for putting me in his article on Reuters on February 16th, just a few days ago. And it was basically, uh, my quote was, the cyclical trade is off to the races, which is a sign of a brand new business cycle, a brand new recovery, and uh, of faster growth to come, said Thomas Hayes. Even if the market was, was going sideways or only modestly higher, we could see materially material rallies under the surface uh, in those laggard groups from last year, and that's going to be a huge play this year. And that was really the theme for this week. Uh, and it's interesting because there were some people out this week saying this is the longest bull market in history. Uh, you can't, you don't have 35% corrections in the beginning of bull markets, uh, nor do you have double digit unemployment during the middle of a bull market. This is a new business cycle. So, um, you know, just by the clear technical definition of where we are and how different sectors are performing. So th this is really a tremendous opportunity. And uh, thanks to Devik for putting me in his article this week. Uh, also, thanks to Arab News. I got picked up in uh, somehow. And uh, this was late last, uh, I think on Friday or Saturday. I said, we're underestimating the lag effect of all the money in the system as more and more vaccinations are delivered and as more of the country reopens from business shutdown, said Thomas Hayes. We're continuing this rotation that would be consistent with the new business cycle. As bond yields go up, value and cyclicals will lead. So we're going to talk a lot about that concept. That's going to be a unified concept here. Uh, not new. We've been talking about it for five to six months, but we're going to add some new uh, um thoughts and concepts in in line with that as we move through this week's podcast video cast because uh, there's a lot of things going on this was an interesting article that got zero play in the media but uh it was in the wall street journal uh four days ago it said iraq rocket attack targets u.s-led coalition in test for biden and then it just completely disappeared um Every new president you is usually tested on a geopolitical front in the first hundred days. I think potentially this administration will be no different. And in that context, we've liked, well, we've liked defense and aerospace, number one, because they're very well valued, even in a flat defense spending environment. And the thesis is on the second half commercial aviation recovery, which I think is going to be uh, more pronounced than people are anticipating. Uh, and we'll talk about a few reasons why moving forward. Uh, but I just thought that that was noteworthy because that is the last thing in the back of people's minds um, that uh, geopolitical issues. No one is thinking about it. And that's usually when things like that tend to pop up. You've got uh, deadlines coming up with the Iran agreement. They're going to stop the uh, flash inspections if they don't get a deal. I believe that is within a couple of weeks. So uh, this type of stuff will bring attention to the um, opportunity in defense and aerospace, uh, I think, in short order. Uh, I posted this um, this podcast from Joe Rogan and Elon Musk this week. I thought it was fantastic because um, I, I loved how honestly Elon Musk explained the genesis of Tesla. And I never knew this, but the genesis of Tesla was, um, you know, not predicated on global warming. The genesis of Tesla was he was worried that we were going to run out of fossil fuels. And his goal, uh, and that's in spite of the advent of shale and all of that stuff, because it, it all declines. Uh, you can just look at the, the decline curves and know that we don't have unlimited um uh, fossil fuels in perpetuity. So we do need all sustainables. We do need wind, as we saw in Texas this week. We need wind. We need coal. And I really think what Bill Gates is talking about with this uh, uh, updated, modernized nuclear, which is clean and efficient, could just be absolutely phenomenal until, you know, some miracle. It's always 20 years away until we get nuclear fusion. But, uh, you know, don't hold your breath on that. But uh, if we did have more uh, clean nu nuclear in the way that Bill Gates is presenting it, I think that could be a tremendous opportunity. But we're going to need it all. The population's growing. The demand is growing. And I, I love the honesty in which he laid that out so so that the 
the basis of the company was a fear of running out of fossil fuels more so than global warming. That said, uh, unlike many people, he actually acknowledges the long-term cycles in climate over time, that they go up and they go down. But he, but he does say that there's some variations in this cycle, although it looks like, you know, over the last 2,000 years, if you look at the ups and downs from, you know, hot during the Roman Empire, medieval times, to cold, you know, various ice ages and mini, mini ice ages, um, he, he says there's, there's some variables that are, that are slightly different this time, and it would be too big of a gamble to just assume that history is going to repeat, and why not take all the steps to um to to hedge against that and i think that's just the most brilliant way to frame it versus just looking at 50 years of data and say you know we're going to fall off the cliff in nine years um you know he he doesn't ascribe to that view but he does ascribe to the view that we uh, need to you know utilize everything we possibly have and he's put out the hundred million dollar prize for for carbon capture uh and he's done more for climate change probably than anyone in the world with um with what he's doing with tesla and the solar and everything else and the other thing that he laid out which actually changed my mind i i i agree with him uh he said that it's a huge mistake to demonize the fossil fuel industry uh, because we desperately need it for the next few decades. And uh, some of the things that they can do are essential for society. You know, his big fear was if we ran out of fossil fuels, you'd go to chaos because, you know, you'd, everyone would just starve. Everything would break down. Society would break down. It's part of the reason he's been interested in other planets as well. So he knows the necessity of fossil fuels, but he also knows that the, the potential risk that we have to hedge against. And his view was that he you know he's talked to dozens of the best economists in the world and his his conclusion and their conclusion was that the best way to change behavior is to have a carbon tax which originally you know my initial instinct is any new taxes are not a good thing um but he put it in the context of rather than demonizing and trying to drive these things into the ground that we desperately need for society and are going to need for for many decades add a carbon tax that is tax deductible so that it's it's not a um uh so it's progressive versus regressive so in other words you know the guy or gal making 15 dollars an hour or 20 dollars an hour that has to drive an hour to work uh you know for their you know uh price at the pump to go from three dollars to four dollars or five dollars it's really regressive because it doesn't affect the rich person you know a couple bucks uh, extra per per gallon in their tank, but you'd actually ha be able to deduct the carbon tax from your income taxes based on your income level. So, so the lower the income level, the bigger the deduction, and it just deters behavior similar to what it did to cigarettes, similar, you know, to a lesser extent what it did with alcohol. And I thought that was, you know, it, it goes against my every fiber of my being but it, it really expanded my thinking and i think probably that's going to be the most reasonable way if we can embrace energy companies and the changes that they're making and the infrastructure that they have in place to deliver uh, both the needed fossils and new sustainables and new carbon capture technology and all of these positive things that we're going to need moving forward as the pop global population grows etc um you know, and you're seeing them take the initiative now with all their decarbonization plans by 2040 and 2050. That's going to enable uh, institutions to get, come back into the fold and, and start to invest in in them again now that they're up 75 to 100 percent each. Um, but, I, you know, I would say Elon Musk kind of brought me around to his thinking on this. And and uh, and if we could embrace the gift that we have with these companies and, and not demonize them but add the carbon tax so we're we are incentivized to make the necessary changes and expansions is really what it's more going to be we we need as much wind and solar and all the other things that we're going to have in addition to the uh, transition with natural gas etc 
it would be a good thing all around. And uh, and Bill Gates' proposal with this modified uh, nuclear, these mini nuclear sites, which will be beneficial for companies, um, you know, in, in big industrial companies like GE, etc. So it's highly worth listen. You know, it's a three hour thing. So obviously, you know, I I list, I listen to it in the background while I have spreadsheets going or doing other stuff um worthwhile to listen to and it changed my view on a very important subject so um anyway that was great uh speaking of energy warren buffett's mystery stock was none other than chevron so he added four billion dollars of chevron uh, in his most recent filing he added um also verizon uh as well both are high dividend payers both will increase the dividend, but it was nice to see a $4 billion purchase in the oil patch and um, and Verizon, uh, Verizon Communications uh, he added as well. So uh, those were the mystery stocks. Now, the lone bear on Wall Street finally capitulated on Wells Fargo. Um, just to update to the end of the day today, Wells Fargo is now up. 83.2% off of its low in late October, right before the election, uh, when we were, you know, we had the, uh, also had the Cobra Kai leg sweep article out in late September. So from the low 20s now to the high 30s, it closed just below $38 today. And um, nothing like price to change opinion, 83% worth of price. And now uh, everyone's finally getting on board, including these, this JP Morgan analyst who's been the most bearish uh on the stock and refused to change as the facts changed and now he's finally come around which is good because it just creates more opening for more institutions to buy it up and in my view is still very very cheap uh in the context of the long term and uh, huge opportunity and obviously we got the big notice this week that um which we'll talk about in the article of the week that the fed announced uh, not the Fed. Well, it, it, the headline was that their proposal to get the cap lifted was accepted. So now they have to follow through on the proposal. And then hopefully by the end of the year or early next year, that cap will be lifted. But the key is the market can not, now start to discount it. Number one. Number two, remember that the stock traded up to $53 with the cap. So, um, you know, if you think about $53, which was the old ceiling, is now the new floor as that cap comes undone, as the yield curve is steepened, as uh, analysts are st starting to jump on board and institutions are panicking into it because they've missed the first 83%. So that's pretty exciting. And then uh, today, this doctor from Johns Hopkins had an uh, editorial in the uh, Wall Street Journal. His name is Marty Macari, and the title of the article is We'll Have Herd Immunity by April. Very bold claim, but this is in line with what I've been saying each week on the podcast that, you know, you're taking down one side of the equation every single week. And his view was, uh, let's see, amid the dire COVID warnings, one crucial fact has been largely ignored. Cases are down 77% over the last six weeks. If a medication slash cases by 77%, we all call it a miracle pill. Why is the number of cases plummeting much faster than experts predicted? in large part because natural immunity from prior infection is far more common than can be measured by testing. Testing has been capturing only from 10 to 25% of infections, depending on when during the pandemic someone got the virus, applying a time-weighted case capture average of one in 6.5 to the cumulative 28 million confirmed cases would mean about 55% of Americans have natural immunity. Now add people getting vaccinated as of this week, 15% of Americans have received the vaccine. And that figure is rising fast. Former uh, Food and Drug Administration Commissioner uh, Scott Gottlieb ex estimates 250 million doses will have been delivered to some 150 million people by the end of March. So there is reason to think the country is racing toward an extremely low level of infection. As more people have been infected, most of whom have mild or no symptoms. There are fewer Americans left to be infected at the current trajectory. I expect COVID will be mostly gone by April, allowing Americans to resume normal life. Guys and gals, this is not me saying this. Uh, let's just check his, uh, 
Uh, so, okay, Dr. Makari is a professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and Bloomberg School of Public Health, chief medical advisor to Sesame Care, and author of The Price We Pay. So, uh, pretty exciting stuff and uh, far more optimistic than I've been, but I've been certainly more optimistic than, than many in terms of adding those two factors into the equation, which has caused the uh, case count to look like GameStop stock and uh, no we're not going to do a ton on roaring kitty today uh, i think uh, people are tired of that uh, here's an interesting article first energy this is a beaten down utility and if you recall last week i said that i think utilities um staples healthcare, utility staples and healthcare, and some big pharma companies are ready to bounce and it was interesting this week, Carl Icahn came along and he he's a similar deep value mindset. And he came in and uh, uh, said he's looking to buy a stake in First Energy Corp and uh, between 184 million to 920 million. And this is a utility company. So uh, I think, you know, you have shifts when people start to notice the utilities have been beaten down. Uh, people are going to be looking for yield, and I th I think we're we're going to enter a short-term period. This doesn't change the cyclical thesis that you know that we've been touting for six months that has been working like gangbusters uh, over the last four or five, which is you know banks, energy, defense, and aerospace. Um, so. So by looking at these new groups that I think are, are due for a bounce, utilities, consumer staples, um, healthcare, and in that context, big pharma, um, there, there are great, great opportunities. So uh, that leads me to a question, ask me anything question from Ben again this week. He said, uh, your stock market sentiment article yesterday stated, Quote, we are, we are also now looking at very selective opportunity in consumer staples, healthcare, utilities, and big pharma. He says, please provide some ETFs you might consider and is now a good entry time or not yet? Thank you, Ben. Um, well, you can never time it perfectly, but uh, I, I do think now is a good time. And we did add a number of staples this week um, to client portfolios and uh, also in the trading service. So at hedgefundtips.com. So um, the ETFs, which is an easier way, we, we deal in predominantly individual names, but the ETFs that would represent them uh, in the case of consumer staples is XLP. In the case of healthcare is XLV. Uh, utilities is XLU. And uh, pharma... Uh, uh, well, it's included in XLV, but you could actually Google um, uh, pharmaceutical ETF and just choose the one that has the biggest market cap. Big Pharma, you know, I like, I like you know, companies like Merck, Pfizer, uh, Bristol Myers. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the members of um, of hedge fund tips came came to me w with an idea in Big Pharma. I was like, you got it exactly. You don't need me anymore. Uh, and, uh, he's off to the races. So, so that's, uh, that was pretty exciting. He's like, no, 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 I, I, you know, uh, but he's doing a great job and he's, he's gets, he's getting it now. As you listen to these week after week, and as you follow along with the charts and you get a feel for the market and you understand the underlying fundamentals, you know, it's, it, this is not rocket science. It, it's not easy, but it's not rocket science. Okay, moving right along. Secretary Janet Yellen makes a push for major stimulus, uh, sees bigger risk in not doing enough. So, so they've got the pedal to the metal on this 1.9 trillion. They're racing against the clock because as these cases collapse and as more people want to go to, go to work, um, you know, it, it's going to be a harder sell to take on that much additional debt. So now they're making the case that, um, you know, a lot of uh, commercial real estate is going to be in trouble and midside businesses are going to be in trouble. And that, that's reasonable. Uh, so they'll probably push it through reconciliation. That's an avalanche of liquidity and um, uh, definitely, definitely worth uh, paying attention to. And that's part of the reason I think that the market was strong today. 
Um, uh, you know, Secretary Yellen did this interview with Sarah Eisen on CNBC after the close yesterday, and she was she was basically um, you know pitching for the counterfactual. If we don't do it, you know, it, people can have long term scarring. Which look that that hundred percent happened during the Great Financial Crisis. So you know, a lot of people between 40 and 55, they never got back into the workforce. And, and that's why you had the opioid crisis. Uh, so her view and sec um, Chair Powell's view is similar. Got to get these people back to work. And, um, you know, and it's a balance because, you know, you have the inflation risk, which she said. She said we have tools for the inflation risk. And, you know, it would be tough to be into their in their shoes uh, what would I do in their shoes? I'd probably go for a smaller package first and be ready with gunpowder right behind it. Um, just because a lot of the existing pre-existing stimulus hasn't even gotten to the system and circulated to the system yet. But, um, you know, that, that's that. Um, now, uh, also, Herb Lash reached out to me from Reuters. I don't think he had an article this week, but... Um, his concern was that, you know, there's a lot of retail money coming into the system. And does that mean we're in Templeton's fourth stage, which is, you know, euphoria, um, rises in skepticism, dies in euphoria, etc. cetera. Uh, Lee Cooperman always talks about it. And, you know, the point I made to him and, and was that one, we're in the beginning of a new business cycle. Two, there are pockets of euphoria. We all know that SPACs, penny stocks, uh, option volumes, and some IPO valuations. And there will be pullbacks, but you can't fight this avalanche of liquidity. And we're going to talk about kind of the pullback measures that we're looking at. Um, short term, obviously, we could see some chop. The market's kind of gone nowhere for the last couple of weeks. The intermediate trend is up. But the other side of it is estimates for earnings and GDP continue to rise on a weekly basis. Although they did level off this week, we're going to look at that. And the vast majority of stimulus hasn't circulated in the system. The name of the game now is daily vaccine shots, which uh, that article today confirmed is going really in the right direction. Uh, it will fuel everything else and unlock trillions of dollars of pent up demand. And that was my point there. So, uh, so it is kind of all tying together here. Uh, I thought I'd lead off with this quote from Warren Buffett that came up today that we posted long ago. Ben Graham taught me that price is what you pay and value is what you get. Whether you're whether we're talking about socks or stocks, I like buying quality merchandise when it is marked down. And that's exactly what we were doing with Wells Fargo in the low to mid 20s. That's exactly what we were doing with energy stocks uh, in, uh, you know, last year on this podcast, six months ago, four months ago, we were hammering them before the election, Exxon Mobil, buying the highest quality, knowing that the lowest quality would be in trouble with, uh, if, uh, drilling was restricted. Um, and that's what we're doing right now with, uh, defense and aerospace, which are still dramatically undervalued in my view. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Ben asked a second, ask me anything question, said, I sent you a new podcast question 10 minutes ago for tomorrow evening. Here's another question. Uh, we will continue to add, oh, quote, you wrote today, quote, we will continue to add defense and aerospace on any weakness on the second half commercial aviation recovery thesis. At what price would you consider buying DFEN? Uh, so there are a number of ETFs to play the defense and aerospace sector. ITA is one. Um, XAR, I think, is another. And DFEN is like a leverage. You have to be careful and know what you're doing with a leverage one. But, you know, I basically told them anywhere between 15 and $18 is fantastic for the long term. And um, in my view, that's opinion, not advice. You can click on terms at hedgefundtips.com, um, you know, and uh, uh, go through that uh, disclaimer. This is all for educational and informational purposes. But uh, that that's really what we're looking at now. And And by the way, uh, we have this mindset, you know, value investing is either in your DNA or it's not. And, uh, some people do very well buying the most expensive stocks in the market when they're breaking out. It's predominantly better for retail traders that have small amounts of money and can be extremely nimble. If you're managing, you know, any size of money, you're not buying breakouts and putting 10 cent stops in. It just doesn't work that way. But, um, 
And also it just really comes down to your DNA. There are so many ways to make money, period, in life, but in the markets and um, the best way to make money is the way that resonates with your composition and with your makeup. And for, for me, I could I could do no other way. Like I, I, I know how the other ways work and this is just the way that works for me. And for other people, they do fantastically well doing it different ways and chasing momentum. And there are a lot of hedge funds that make huge money chasing momentum and chasing trends as well. Um, so so that's that. Now, Ray Dalio has this quote, which is, you know, uh, very well known, but it's it's important for what we're going to cover now. And uh, he says, it all comes down to interest rates. As an investor, all you're doing is putting up a lump sum payment for a future cash flow. And that's with any asset that you buy. So um, this was particularly interesting. Uh, Sarah Ponzek of Bloomberg, I really like following her stuff. You can follow her on Bloomberg at Sarah Ponzek. And this, this gentleman, Daniel Curtis, DRB Curtis, who I guess works for Bloomberg and does all the charts and tables for, for the show, they put out this table that shows what happens to the net present value of 10 years of cash flows for each percent that interest rates go up. So if you're a 3% growth company versus a 30% growth company, what they're trying to say here is that as interest rates go up, um, the companies that will be hit the hardest are the high growth or high flying tech stocks or the SaaS stocks or the stocks with no earnings trading at 30 times sales, which there are a lot of. And those are pockets of froth in that, in my view, that we have currently in the market. I don't believe the overall market is uh, frothy. Uh, and I'm less interested in the indices than I am with the underlying sectors and stocks. I think there's certain underlying sectors and stocks, which I've just covered with you, which we're going to cover more uh, in this podcast video cast that represent tremendous, in some cases, generational value. Wells Fargo was generational value when we were pounding the hell out of it and people were laughing at us saying, you know, old banks will never make it. You know, what are you paying for? You know, pens on chains and marble marble tables. And, and, you know, it's just a different point of view. But um, those opportunities really come around. The last time that opportunity came around for Wells Fargo was uh, uh, the great financial crisis was one time. And there was only one other time uh, in the history of the company, which was the early 90s. And those were times when it traded down to a 40 percent discount to book. And we got one last opportunity uh, uh, last year. And we, you know, went huge into it. And when when public sentiment was totally against us, they were over-reserved because most people didn't understand the Cecil accounting change, which we talked about on CNBC London in July. And many times after that on Cheddar and uh, Fox and other other networks. And um, they didn't, they underestimated the amount of reserves that would be released because uh, you know, 115 billion were taken by the industry on the uh, predicated on the worst case scenario, which they were thinking was, you know, 20 to 30 percent unemployment when it was at 14. And it said it went to 6.3. So more and more of those reserves are going to come back as earnings, the yield curve steep and et cetera, et cetera. So getting back to interest rates. So for like the value companies growing three, five, 10 percent a year, you know, each increased percentage in interest rates, you know, will have a lesser effect. So a 1% increase would, would cause a slower growth company to decline by 6% versus a higher uh, growth company would be by 7%. But when, when rates start to go up more materially, the difference is more pronounced. Uh, when rates go up 2%, you know, the high growth companies will be down 14%. When they go up 3%, the high growth companies will be down 20%. And uh, the the more rates go up, the more the high growth companies fall and uh, relative to value and uh, the more stayed companies. So this is the type of environment where uh, rising rate environment where value and cyclicals outperform. The reason you've had a 10-year period where buying stocks at 10 times sales worked is because you had the lowest rates in history. And if you believe that that's now moderating, then you do not believe that buying companies at 10 times sales in the next 10 years is going to work 
anything like it worked in the last 10 years because that was the only period in history where it's ever worked. Usually that was a way to get your head chopped off. Um, but um, if you believe that rates are going to be close, you know, move up another percent, maybe they'll stabilize. They can't go up too much. Uh, then, uh, then you have to kind of shift with the, with the times and, uh, and take advantage of what's in front of us. And that's what we're trying to talk about here. Uh, the article that Sarah wrote in Bloomberg, on Bloomberg was, uh, on the basis of rates, 10 year yields have had the fastest monthly rise since 2018. So that's this table here. And she's making the point that uh, we're already seeing, you know, the arcs of the world and the momentum chasers um, uh, like Tesla, uh, for instance, uh, was down 10 percent in 10 days with this most recent rate rise. So she she's using the quantitative data that Daniel provided in this table as rates go up. These growth companies are going to get hit first. And, and when you think of growth, you think of the Teslas, you think of the arcs. And the, and the type of companies that are in the arc uh, that will be uh, have faced greater headwinds than the, than the market in general uh, over time if the raise in rates sustains uh, or even advances. So, you know, it's all to be determined, but, but this is the math of how it affects uh, net present value of discounting future cash flows. Uh, and that's that. Now, um, to be sniffing around staples, utilities, and healthcare slash pharma is not a very um, bullish view in a sense that those are defensive groups. So that's where an institutional managers go when they're looking to hide um, in the general market. So it's it's kind of a conflicting view to you know have all these banks and energy from obviously much lower basis and adding defense and, and aerospace while at the same time starting to nibble on staples, utilities, uh, and some big pharma, uh, you know, how, how is that working? And if we look at this ratio of the 210 spread that we've, you, that was the, the basic core thesis in why we were buying the hell out of banks last year and, and talking about it on the podcast and video cast every single week when everyone else was, you know, not on board at all, um, is that uh, if you look at this, this, this ratio, 10 year yield to two year yield is the steepest now it's been since 2011, coming off the floor from, you know, 2007 when the curve inverted, then you got the recession, 2019 when the curve inverted, and then you got the recession. So it generally doesn't get much the ratio doesn't get much steeper than this. Uh, now, fin as it levels out and even starts to compress again, financials continue to rise. So it, it basically just needs to take them on the floor, start credit expansion once again, get people into the market, get growth back into the market, extend the credit, and that jump starts the economy. It's like the guy on, on the, the hospital bed and you put the paddles to him. That's what steepening the yield curve this fast and this quickly does is it's those it's the paddles on the chest to bring them back to life. And then it starts to be self self uh, perpetuating. And that's where we are right now. This can't get more extreme than it's been, which means that this is probably the ratio of the two year yield to the 10 year yield is probably going to start to flatten. Uh, uh, and certainly the rate of the ch rate of change is going to drop. Um, and what that means is this, this ratio will probably go sideways and then start to roll over. As it starts to roll over, people will be saying banks are dead. But as we see in the last two cycles, it's just the beginning of the rally for financials and banks, even after that ratio starts to compress. Um, and it'll probably compress from the two-year yield actually starting to creep up a little bit in anticipation of the Fed having to raise uh, as the inflation numbers start to come in, like we saw the PPI this week came in a little hot already. So these are things we've been talking about. It's just the beginning of wage inflation. Walmart announced that they were going to increase uh, everyone's salaries. Um, you know, in the last earnings call and their stock was down 6%, uh, I guess it was last night. 
on the basis of those increased costs. So wages are sticky and they're doing that part because they're nice people, but more because they have to compete to get labor. They have to compete with other businesses now reopening. But more than that, they got to compete with the government because there's the extended unemployment till September. And it's at, you know, on the top end of 40,000 a year run rate, very hard to incentivize people to go back to work to make less money than to sit at home and make more money. So uh, wages are going to be sticky. Commodity prices, I mean, you just look at copper and oil. Uh, you don't need to really uh, look further. You know, inflation is uh, it's coming. So, um, so, so that's that. And that's why this, this is important. So if you do see this ratio go sideways or even start to roll over as it did in 2003, etc., cetera, um, th that's when people will look at those kind of defensive sectors and take a, take a new look. So they, they've sold off because yields have shot through the roof. Um, as yields stabilize or even come, come in a little bit, there will be a bid for staples. There will be a bid for utilities. There will be a bid for healthcare, uh, and, and some big pharma and dividend yielders, uh, in general. Uh, and, uh, and that's, that sell off will lead to a big bounce. And that's why we're looking there now because of where, how far and how fast we've come on this ratio of the two year yield to the 10 year yield. The other thing is we're looking at the Pring consumer staple model. This is just an indicator. You know, I look at hundreds of these, but um, if you look at every time it's, you know, rallied and peaked and started to roll over, that was basically the bottom for staples. So this black line in the background is XLP, which is the consumer staples ETF. This red and black line is the Pring consumer staple model. When that rolls over, it means the sell-off is done and it starts to rally. And that's been the case for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I think 13 or 12 or 13 of the last 14 instances in the last two and a half years, when it's peaked and rolled over, staples rallied. When it's peaked and rolled over here, staples rallied. When it's peaked and rolled over, staples rallied. When it's peaked and rolled over, staples rallied. When it's peaked and rolled over, staples rallied, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, over and over and over rinse and repeat and that's why we were buying staples in the market this week individual names um directly and through uh options some of and the other beauty of staples by the way i mean uh is if you're buying straight options and you're not offsetting it in a spread the implied vol volatility is relatively low on staples and on utilities it's still elevated everywhere so buying straight premium you have to really pick your spots obviously you're seeing straight premium at record highs retail uh mass amount of these retail people coming to the market don't know how to price premium so the sellers and the dealers are having a field day selling to them at you know 40 and 60 and 80 times implied volatility in some case triple digit implied volatility like you you can be so right on the underlying and still lose money buying premium at at, the, at those prices that it's just insane so either do it through spreads or now in the case of staples you can you can find some relatively good bargains low implied volatility mid-20s on some of these names which does make sense if you're buying enough time and you can really make nice multiples so uh that's that uh this is interesting i want to just show there, there are crosswinds, and that was the theme of our Roaring Kitty article this week. Um, you know, where you had 58 billion of equity inflows last month, but if you look at the longer term, so much money has moved into bonds over the last 10 years from the baby boomers that now is being offset by millennials getting into equities, and there are more millennials, 85 million, than boomers, 80 million. So there is a sea change. And we may very well just be at the beginning of it. This is from at macro charts on Twitter. He puts out or she puts out, I don't know what it is, um, uh, a lot of decent charts throughout the week. They're worth a follow. And what they're saying is global equity flows have reversed just a fifth of the record outflows since 2018. The sources from Goldman Sachs. Number one, this is similar to when global economy was recovering from past major downturns if history repeats buyers may just be getting started and here's the chart that he uh presents from goldman sachs 
And as you can see, despite the 58 billion infl inflows, it really is just beginning. If you look in a historical sense, this new business cycle from 2003 to 2007, from 2012 to 2014, and here we are, and then after the 16 sell off to 18, and then here we are again. So uh, short term, it um, looks like a lot of inflows. You take a step back and take a longer term perspective. Uh, there may be a lot of catch up. Here's another one that he did. The broad ETFs and funds look identical. And uh, it shows that when you have these red, so this is uh, one year net flows of SPY, that's the S&P 500 ETF, IVV and VOO, which are broad ETFs as well. Uh, that, you know, you often have these recover from red to green. You get that first rally off the lows and then it goes green for quite a while before you have the next correction. So again, showing that it might just be getting started with the equity inflows. And then you have the crosswinds. Here's something from Sentiment Trader. It says investors have $465 billion in credit sitting in cash and margin accounts. They owe $798 billion against the value of their securities. That's a new record deficit. Uh, Liz Clayman covered this on the Clayman Countdown today that you have record margin debt um, right now. And that's evidenced here. So, you know, you have this kind of like strange dichotomy between equity flows just beginning and then uh, margin debt at all time highs. And it could be that, you know, maybe people aren't selling out of all of their fixed income, but they they desperately want uh, equity exposure and that's how they're getting it. And certainly with, with rates as low as they are and you can borrow it effectively. Well, it depends what brokerage you're, you're at or, or, or prime broker, effectively nothing you know, you you need to get more exposure to get similar returns. And, and that's probably some of what we're seeing with low rates here as well. Uh, so good chart from at Sentiment Trader. And then uh, this was from Ned Davis Research. And what it shows is that in a secular bull market, uh, on average, it takes 84 days to get your first 5% correction from the bottom. 331 days to get your first 10% correction and 1,105 days to get your first 20% correction on balance. Now we're 227 days in, so we would basically have, um, you know, we would have more or less 850, 880 days until on average, you'd get your first 20%. And that's why I've been talking about these three and 4% corrections are more likely to get multiple of those similar to 2017 than to get, um, you know, a 10 to 20%. Could we get a 10%? Sure, we could. There, You know, anything can happen. Uh, but it doesn't support it after, you know, after you have a heart attack, you have, you know, aftershocks, but you don't generally get a second heart attack the next day. And, um so this just basically shows the statistical analysis since 1930. And um, that would imply, um, you know, we did get 5% corrections, um, I think, uh, for the right before the election. So those are done. The 10% are probably uh, within the, you know, on average would be in the next, hundred or so days maybe uh if it's like 2017 it might get pushed off till next year and then the bigger corrections that would you know more likely be later out and that's interesting to see because recency bias leads why a lot of people miss the rally off off the lows in march is recency bias is every one or two percent pullback people were thinking that we were going to get an immediate 20 percent pullback again and we never got it and when everyone's looking for that is when you don't get it and it just shows that there may be a lot more runway here than people think, uh, despite the big move off the lows in the longer term context, the, the game may just be getting started. Opinion follows trend. Uh, the big oil stocks that Goldman says have up to 50% upside ahead of a global recovery. So uh, they listed you know, a bunch of stocks. The interesting thing I thought was interesting at the end of this article from Barron's was that um okay uh, they talk about um, royal dutch shell and any spa and bp 
and they talk about the dividend yield, strong balance sheet, and along with Royal Dutch Shell for its decarbonization strategy, potential dividend hike, and prospect of a share buyback program, and Italy's Enispa for strong pipeline of project startups, uh, etc. So it's in the context of the 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 red mat is being the red carpet is being rolled out to welcome back the institutions under the premise which we've been talking about for the last few months that all these companies would come out with their decarbonization plans their carbon capture plans their net zero plans by 2040 2050 2060 and that would open the door where institutions could say we have to support these companies they're necessary for the transition look at all that they're doing and they'll get the esg stamp and uh, sure enough, today, we, last week, we showed five companies that were, were had already announced their plans. Today, Italy's Enispa uh, vows to become carbon neutral by 2050. So they're laying the groundwork now. That it's, uh, So here's their little graph, uh, how they're going to be down 25% by 2030 and 65% by 2040 and net zero by 2050. And all of these companies are going to come out with these tables that haven't already. Uh, and this is what we predicted that by the time the group is up 100%, all of these companies will have their plans so that institutions could buy up and chase uh, as the weight moves from 2 to 2.5 to 4% to 6% to 8%. And then the final holdouts will get in at 150, 200% up off the lows. Uh, and that'll be closer to the end of the cycle than the beginning of the cycle. But um, uh that's that. So, so that theme continues to persist. For those of you who've been with us uh, for the last few months, we've been anticipating that, and now it's playing out. Next is uh, the chart of the day at chartoftheday.com. This just shows the 2021 performance relative to the average performance over the last decade for each sector. Tech is uh, up um, much less, you know, less than 5%. Energy is up almost 20% for the year relative to its negative 2% average for the last 10 years. So the biggest producers, uh, biggest performers this year so far relative to their 10-year uh, average is um, uh, looks like energy, financials, and then I guess that's communication services. So those three and that's nice to see visually uh how that's doing moving right along uh this was the february bank of america global fund manager survey results we're going to cover the highlights here in the roaring kitty stock market article that was our article of the week and we started off talking about keith gill aka roaring kitty aka deep effing value <laughs> those are his handles on reddit and youtube He's the guy who put out a relatively solid fundamental thesis on GameStop and got it more right than anyone could, could have imagined. But as always, they sacrificed the virgin. He's getting sued now and has to testify in front of Congress. He had to testify in front of Congress. I thought he did a pretty good job uh, affirming that he is not a cat and uh, having some interesting pictures in the background. Uh, at least he has a sense of humor. So, uh, you know, He's he's the one that's, you know, taking a lot of heat and the brokers, you know, the brokers now, obviously, it's come out that they just simply didn't have the capital. It was either shut off the trade or go out of business and or that's how they're presenting it. But they cost Roaring Kitty and many of these other retail traders tens of millions of dollars of profits by shutting that down. And it's just disappointing because they really had them by the, you know you know what uh they they, they they really outsmarted some sophisticated folks that just didn't know either weren't checking because the short interest is not published on a daily basis i think it's once or twice a month so they they may not have known that it was 140 percent of the float uh but they should have known it was getting too high and taking the risk down anyway could have should have would everyone makes mistakes but um you know, it, it, it's just a shame because it did burn a lot of people. It especially burned the people that bought in late that weren't following a fundamental thesis, that were buying, you know, the breakout and not really knowing the fundamentals like Roaring Kitty did, um, et cetera. But the reason we brought up Roaring Kitty, one is because he was testifying that day, but two is kind of the Roaring Kitty style 
market, the behavior it represents in the market at present. So we've covered a little bit of this, but you know, you can see penny stock buying is at record highs, call option buying is at record highs, low quality stocks are outperforming high quality stock. That's also attributable to a new business cycle. That's pretty common in a new business cycle uh, because they're the most economically sensitive, sensitive the most uh, levered to a high growth, high nominal GDP growth environment, which we're now in. Um, and the demand for lowest quality credit and junk has never been higher. That's uh, partially attributable to distortion by the Fed, and um, but they did what they had to do and saved us from a Great Depression. So that's that's a good thing. Uh, at the same time, you have record inflows into volatility ETFs. So as much as people are chasing stocks, they're also buying the VIX to hedge against downturns. And those two things are so conflicting because, um, albeit, you know, probably not institutions buying these retail ETFs, but um, what that says to me is there's still caution and worry despite the pockets of euphoria. So um, there's overall hedging still happening, which is usually inconsistent with a big correction, which is consistent with what we've been saying, that these modest pullbacks and multiple of them are much more likely this year than, than a bigger pullback. And that also has to do with the Ned Davis research I just showed. So um, it also shows uh, this chart here from bullmarkets.co that how many days the VIX is above 20 is usually after you get the huge rally off the cyclical lows like we've just had uh, and 13 of the 14 times uh, that you did see these type of inflows into the VIX ETFs the market actually the S&P actually rose versus fell, fell. so um, You know, all of this be behavior, the commonality is new business cycle behavior. And so while we've run a lot off the bottom and many people are looking for a major correction, you know, I think the minor corrections are where it is. And I, and I honestly think you'll miss so much money if you're paying attention to the general indices in this type of market. Because the indices can just keep grinding sideways, you know, and doing like 10 basis points a day and you just make no money. The real money is going to be made in the sector rotation under the surface, the rallies under the surface, which we've been overemphasizing for the last, you know, couple of months and we're seeing it and it's happening. So um, your money's not going to be made in the general indices per se, although I do think we probably finish out with a mid teens year. Uh, but, I think that under the surface, you can make a lot more if you're rotating into the things that are a little bit overdone and uh, and then rotating out when they get a little overdone. You know, I, I, I candidly, you see all of this, you, you know, excitement now about everyone starting to get into energy and on a what on a, you know, two to five year basis, I think it's cheap as hell here, but on a short-term basis, I get a little nervous when everyone jumps in after 70, after it's up 75 to 100 percent. Same thing with banks. I, you know, um, so I know that they have huge upside over the next few years, and with now this uniform interest in jumping in, with many of the banks and energy stocks being up 75 to 100 percent, my spidey sense says that you know, you probably may, may or may not, um, there, there just might be too much of a panic and, and you get real institutional money in now. But um, I'm looking to where people aren't looking. Uh, you know, we were looking to where people weren't looking on banks and energy months ago. Now we're looking, to, you know, we're holding because we own it at much, much lower bases. Now we're looking to where people aren't looking in defense and aerospace predominantly. And then, uh, as a long-term trade, and then I think we're going to get bounces in staples, utilities, um, healthcare, which and healthcare, which is some of the health insurers and some of the big pharma. That that's kind of where I think is due for a bounce, and I've kind of explained why I think that ratio between the two and ten years is now going to actually stop going up because everyone's focused on rates going up so fast that that's usually when they stop. 
And with everyone now, you know, piling into banks and energy, I think the rate of change will slow down for those. And some of these groups that everyone's left for dead because rates rose so quickly uh, are now probably going to get bid. And that potentially includes some of the beat, beat down REITs also, which I haven't said anything about uh, or paid a huge amount of attention because some of them have run, run a bit. So um, that's that. Insiders are selling insider transactions ratio from Thomson Reuters and DailyShot.com. Uh, they're, they're selling, but that, insider selling is not usually a good indicator. Insider buying can be a good indicator, um, but it's just of note that the, the risk reward favors at much lower levels is, is basically what I'm saying. Uh, what does this tell us? That there's mania, euphoria, and fear all at the same time. So long as that fear stays intact, the market can climb the wall of worry, but it's unclear other than the flows above how pronounced that fear is. The flows into the VIX. So um, again, my default when you have this many crosswinds is to ignore the indices and just look under the surface. And we've talked about what under the surface we feel makes sense at these levels. For a better look, Another view is the institutions. What are they doing? The Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey. We put out the full summary on Tuesday. Key points are um, more managers are taking higher than normal risk levels than at any other time in the last two decades. So that's a little bit of a red flag. Part of that's probably the catch-up play because a lot of them missed it, waiting for the uh, retest of the lows that never came. Uh, and second is 84% of managers are expecting global corporate profits to improve over the next 12 months. This sentiment is consistent with a new business cycle as we can see the same thing happened in February of 2002 and in December of 2009. So this is actually very bullish and, uh, and very helpful. Third, uh, there was a couple week bounce back into tech after the huge multi-month run in value and cyclicals. That was in January. Uh, value and cyclicals have come back since then in the first few weeks of a uh, couple weeks of February, this also restored long tech as the most crowded trade in January. So um, uh, that's that that's already bounced back and reversed itself. Um, Bitcoin was the second most crowded trade. And the interesting thing that we pointed to last week that's of great importance that I said was we were watching Apple. Apple reported perfect earnings. Uh, in every way, and it's and it's been it's down on about 10% since, and it just keeps it keeps trending lower. So, um, my general view is this rotation persists. Number one and number two, with the heaviest weight in the S and P trending down like this, that's why I'm of the view that paying attention to the indices is not going to be helpful. Because if you have the heaviest weight trending down, uh, e either as a function of fundamentals we don't yet know about, or that it's a source of funds for redemptions from the hedge funds that were caught sideways in January that have to redeem out by the end of the quarter, then um, the indices will do nothing. And where's the opportunity under the surface? And um, so, so Apple is my tell for the market right now. And that could change, but right now that's that. Um, and that's that. So Michael Hartnett, he always puts out good commentary. Uh, what I thought was interesting, you know, he's <laughs> the only reason to be bearish is that there's no reason to be bearish. Uh, record flow of money into equity funds. B of A strategies warn that such ex exuberance may precede a correction. So we've addressed the record flow. That's a one-off week. If you look at it in perspective, that's not that important. Um... High exposure to commodities, emerging markets, industrials, banks relative to the last 10 years. But January wobble caused investors to top up safety and growth. Um, so that was that. And then contrarian trades. Uh, just ignore that. That will That's logging out. Um, longs in emerging markets, commodities, industrial, most vulnerable to peak profits narrative. Either way. Consumer staples is a smart contrarian accumulator in first half one. That's nice to see because we started talking about that in last week's podcast. They put that out in this week's note. I generally agree. You have to be selective on a stock by stock basis. Yes, you can play the ETF, but I, I think things are coming across. And it's interesting he put that as a contrarian trade. 
it's generally how I think. I like to go where the puck is going, not where it is. And uh, I think it makes sense to get some exposure in Staples. So that was helpful. Uh, tying it all together. By the way, on the podcast, it's going to cut out in 30 seconds. Go to hedgefundtips.com. Click on the video cast. Fast forward it to minute 60. And it's word for word the same. You'll get the last five minutes. There's some important things we have to cover. You may want to check in and, and do that. Um, so this is a new business cycle. There's, there's reason to be optimistic. And a substantial portion of good news is priced into the general indices, but not fully priced into selected lower weighted laggard sectors. Uh, and we, we've covered this. So what we're accumulating and where we're pivoting to uh, right now, we're beginning to notice that utility staples, healthcare pharma are a bit overdone to the downside, maybe due for a bounce. Okay, so we've covered that. Now, on the Wells Fargo update, it, it, it's now become a famous article, the famous Cobra Kai leg sweep article on Wells Fargo we put out on September 24th. And the point we were making was that the concept of the painful leg sweep was designed to take out the final week holders. And that was basically it. It got a little weaker the next week, but then it just ripped, ripped higher. And you can click on that article here. Um, it's up, as of the writing of this article, is up 60.2% from that article. It's actually up higher now, as you can see, from the full sweep to today's close is up 83.2%. Wells Fargo in the last uh, one, two, three, three and a half, almost four months. Um, so um, it's still trading at a discount to book. Yield curve is still steepening. They still have billions of credit reserves and they've got 8 billion of expenses that they can take out of the business. And now all the analysts are bullish after the 83% move off the lows. So um, I brought up this Justin Mammoth. I found out who actually did this sentiment cycle. I, I, I brought this up originally back in August and September when we were talking Wells Fargo. Uh, I guess it's a guy named Justin Mammoth. It's the sentiment cycle. And Wells Fargo is following exactly this sentiment cycle where it goes from uh, enthusiasm to subtle warning to overt warning, then it crashes, panic, discouragement, anxiety. Uh, so I, I think this was a pronounced discouragement phase, actually, that persisted through October, longer than normal. And then we rallied up to at 34, 36 at the beginning of the year. That was anxiety, like people missed it. Then it flushed them out here into aversion right here and now we've just taken out the aversion high so maybe we go back and back test the breakout here at 3464 or whatever that little this and then usually this is the steepest fastest part of the cycle so you know maybe maybe we'll get lucky here and see it um revert back to um the last high that it traded while it had the asset cap which was you know 52 53 dollars which is a huge move from here and then from there, as the cap comes off and a couple years follow, I, I, you know, I think this could be a 60, 70, 80 dollar stock over time. And, you know, we'll take some profits, you know, at different levels as we move up. But I, I do think that this is uh, is a great long term opportunity. It was certainly generational when we were pounding the table last year. That, that comes once or twice in a lifetime. And uh, we're just grateful to to take advantage of it and for those of you who have been following us uh, many of you took advantage as well so that's exciting and um and that's that and and this gives you the longer term context of, of kind of where we are this was one of the charts that we put out here when it broke below this and that was kind of the leg sweep period and i was like you know this is where all the volume was so they supported the stock 14 out of 15 times it did this ADX cross. It, it was positive and we were just hung in there and we're adding. And But when you look in the long-term context, it's it's just got so much room to go. And then when it finally breaks out from this basically consolidation since 2015, like you had during the great financial crisis, when it finally breaks out, I mean, it doubled last time. You know, you could maybe you would get a double with all the millennials, 85 million. Maybe it's a $100 stock. I don't know. But um you know, as you get hundred and plus percent profits, you can, you know, peel, peel some out and keep some for the long run, uh, or do whatever you want. <laughs> but, um, okay. So this was another catalyst this week. Wells Fargo wins fed acceptance for overhaul tied to plan tied to cap. And, uh, this was the sentiment data this week. Re 
retail is euphoric at 47.1% bullish. So that is a warning signal. Um, but it did look similar in right after the last election. You did get this spike up here and the market, you know, you had these one, two, three, four, five, three to four percent pullbacks in 2017, but it just kept pounding up. I think I think that's the type of environment we're in post-election. Uh, and this might be very, very similar. Uh, fear and greed was neutral at 66. <laughs> and the National Association of Active Investment Managers were exuberant chasing the market after dumping out of it for that one week in late January. Let's see, because this one tends to change right after I post the article. So let's see where it is now. Um, all right, I'll let that pull up. Oh, hold on for a second. Okay, that would be an AIM. Okay, so that is at 108. No, it's still elevated. So they're still at 108% equity exposure. And the message for the week was we'll continue to add defense and aerospace on any weakness um, and hold banks and energies as we have a uh, much lower basis. New, we're also looking at very selective opportunities in consumer staples, healthcare, utilities, and big pharma. These groups will start to perk up when this chart from Tom McClellan finally begins to matter. This is just a chart of the equity put call ratio, uh, 21 day moving average, which base it's the lowest reading since 2000, which means everyone's buying calls. No one's buying puts. Uh, so that, you know, that, that tends to change that that'll be one of the catalysts but i i think the ratio between the two year yield and the 10 year yield is more important i think that's going to start to go sideways now or down and uh, rates are going to compress or or stop going up the rate of change is going to change and then people are going to start to look at yield again and where they're going to look in those sectors so pay te pay less attention to the general indices many crosswinds and more attention to take advantage of the rallies under the surface through sector rotation that's the Wells Fargo, 83% move. That's Apple we're keeping an eye on. Earnings, uh, we did healthcare top 30 weights. Uh, their 2021 earnings power cumulative was up 1.43% in the last 60 days. Financials top 30 weights were up 8.3% in the last 60 days. Uh, communication services were up 6.58%, only 22 stocks in the last 60 days. Technology was up 2.83% in the last 60 days, their 2021 earnings estimates. Uh, economic data mixed this week. Existing home sales were great, 6.69 uh, versus 6.61. Uh, that was good, up uh, six tenths of a percent. Services PMI beat expectations. Manufacturing PMI was in line with expectations. Uh, we had a huge crude draw, which was good to see. Uh, rig counts came down one. Uh, total rig count was flat at 397. Oil was down one. Uh, that might might have been attributable. No, I don't think that would have been Texas because the data came out uh, earlier than that. Seven million, seven point two million draw in crude inventories, which was huge, uh, versus negative 2.4 estimates. So that trend continues that we've been talking about since last June. Natural gas storage missed, but that'll be offset by Texas. Uh, Philadelphia Fed manufacturing beat expectations. Initial jobless claims were worse than expected. Why this matters is because continuing jobless claims. I've always discounted initial jobless claims because continuing under the last, um, you know, uh, prior to um, mid-January were always coming down. Now that they now they've come up, they missed expectations. So that's that's uh, red flag. Oh, yellow yellow light. I would say that's a yellow light because usually even if the initials are bad or miss, the continuing comes down and they miss too. So keeping our eyes on that. Um, building permits were up. That's good. And capacity utilization beat expectations. That was good. Retail sales were great off the charts. That was from the nine hundred billion dollar stimulus uh, package and uh, checks at the lower end that were spent immediately, which is good. Uh, that helps a lot of businesses. PPI ran a little hot. That's why we're keeping our eye on inflation. We discussed that earlier. New York Empire State Manufacturing beat expectations. So good and bad, mixed, uh, watching the employment number. These earnings expectations are now going sideways versus going up. So we have to keep our 
our eye on that. And that's another reason we're looking at some of these more defensive sectors in the short term until this uptrend resumes, which if that doctor is correct about the April herd immunity, uh, which is a bold claim, then this will start to tick right back up. But uh, they were flat this week, so we got to keep our eye on that. So with that said, I'd like to thank you for joining in this week. We covered a lot of data. I hope you found it helpful. There was a lot of new stuff that we threw on uh, here that I hope you'll find helpful and uh, make it a great one. We'll be back next week, same time, same place.